I love Montague House in Somerset. I think it's one of the most beautiful Elizabethan houses in the country. And I know it really well because my grandparents used to live in the village. So I spent a lot of my childhood running around here and um, climbing the very muddy hill behind the house called St. Michael's Hill. And like, the village itself is very beautiful. So for me, it was a very natural setting. And in fact, it was the house that inspired the story. I chose this, the period in history that I did to set the book because that's when this house was built. It's quite historically accurate, the book. So it's, um, the, pit, the house was just being finished as I set the book. So it's the end of the 16th century. And um, it is a, a wonderful period in history that I've always loved. I love the Elizabethan period and I particularly like looking at the end of her reign because we have this idea of this wonderful Elizabethan era and the Armada and the great conquests. But in fact, the end of her reign was very difficult. There was a lot of poverty, plague. It was a very difficult, high taxes, lower income. So it was a very difficult period in which to live. And the book isn't a sort of fairy tale about the Elizabethan time. It's quite gritty and muddy, and it's about what it was really like to live at that time in history. Montague House starts when Seth Perrin, a 13-year-old girl, discovers a pendant hidden in the chicken coops where she works. And uh, it sets her thinking, is this for me? What's this all about? And then at the same time, um, a boy is found dead in the village and her best friend disappears. This is all on her 13th birthday. And that sets uh, in train some events which lead her to uncover a plot um, that will affect, without giving away the story too much, that will affect the country as a whole. So there's a spy hole here. I knew there were secret passages behind this panelling. Seth is 13 when the book opens and she doesn't know who her father is. And because of that, in Elizabethan society, it meant she was the lowest of the low, really. She was very lucky because she has a job looking after the poultry in Montacute House. And she's treated very badly because she has no status or rank in society. She feels this hostility towards her, but there's a, something in her that doesn't give up. She's quite feisty, and she has quite wide horizons about what is possible for her life when this train of events is set into motion that, that starts the book. And by the end of the book, obviously, her life has changed totally. I think I found writing fiction slightly more challenging than non-fiction. I think I sometimes felt my brain sort of on fire with smoke coming out of my ears. I was trying to work out who did what when and if this had happened in the plot, what would happen then? And really trying to imagine what it would have been like to be then, um, to live in that time and what people would have said to each other and so on. So I found writing fiction um, used my brain even more than writing non-fiction. The research process is very similar and that's my, f I love doing the research. So. But obviously, non-fiction and fiction, you do a lot of research. But fiction, obviously, you're not following a story, you're creating your own story. And sometimes it's really challenging to actually remember where you are and where your book needs to go. And, it, and it's very good fun, because often it takes you off somewhere you weren't really expecting. Michael's Hill. I used to climb it as a child a lot and come down the very, very steep banks on my bottom on a plastic bag in the mud, get absolutely covered and covered in wild garlic as well, so it's very smelly. But I absolutely love playing here and uh, it felt very magical and mystical even then. And as I got older, I heard all the legends about the hill that there are tunnels through the hill that go right to the top down to Montacute House, which is just over there and to the Abbey Gatehouse, which is there, which is the, all that remains of the old monastery that Henry VIII pulled down. The witches in my book are based very much on witches I've actually met. They're quite inspiring, strong women who themselves believe very much in nature and natural forces and in the inherent power that we have in ourselves, particularly for sort of clairvoyant thought and seeing ahead of time and things like that. They're not the sort of witches that ride broomsticks and sort of wave magic wands and things like that. A lot of what the main witch character in the book does is healing which would very much be recognised in an Elizabethan setting. There were healers, and she was unusual because she's a combined healer and a witch. But it certainly wouldn't have been unknown in Elizabethan times. It's based quite closely on historical 
accuracy as well as real witches that I know. Oh, it's lovely at the top. And there's a fantastic view of Montacute House just over there. Oh, it's worth the climb, although it is quite steep. The boy appeared to have died of the sweat, but we believe it is man and not nature that lies behind the death and disappearances. We fear great evil has been unleashed and that sorcery is involved. Why are you telling me this, said Cess. I know nothing of man's plagues or of sorcerers. Alethea appeared to consider her words carefully before continuing. The evil threatens us all, everyone in the country, but it hovers closer to you than to others, Cecily, she replied. Cess pulled her hands away, shocked by Alethea's strange prophecy. Closer to me? What do you mean? The questions tumbled out of Cess's mouth. She felt Edith's arm move protectively around her. You are in greater danger from this evil than I was when the villagers sought to take my life, said Edith. The fear Cess saw in her friend's face unnerved her. Cess was astonished that practical, clever Edith could be talking of evil just as the parson did. Evil, repeated Cecily. You mean witches? She asked, not knowing of anything else that could be so described. Not witches, replied Edith firmly. Witches do not involve themselves in such practices. They work only for good. For good? Making people ill and putting disease in their cattle, cried Cess, shocked at what Edith was saying. There was a long pause before Edith spoke again. Do you think I would do those things, she asked. Of course not, Cess answered immediately, but you're not a witch. Edith moved to face her young friend and put her hands on Cess's shoulders. She looked Cess straight in the eye and without hesitation she replied, yes I am. <laughs>